rotting man lies on his side with his eyes looking straight through you. His body is supine and open to intrusion by autopsy. The lieutenant adjusts his glasses and takes a deep breath. Shoot, Looney Rooney. Come back later, Corpo. Amuse yourself with my frank manners and my memento mori features. If possible, also, see me in your dreams. Clothes. The deceased wears armored boots and white briefs. The make of the briefs is Babrodin, I think. Let's see. <gasps> see, it's happening. Babrodin, yes. Inexpensive. Size M. Color white. The disappointment is palpable. The red-haired thing was expecting something more lurid. The rest of the clothes have been removed post-mortem by scavengers in order to get to the victim's ceramic armor. Officers are in search of the missing pieces. Removal of the boots is left for processing. It would be clever of you to omit the boots altogether, sire. If you are to keep them for yourself, as you ought to, you have deserved them more than anyone else. Patience. After the autopsy, before the body is taken away, there will be a window of opportunity. After the lieutenant has gone to sleep, I hope this has helped you, my liege. The boat has a serial number. It's E50.100.100. The lines between the plates are in the shape of the alphanumerical. The number is purposefully concealed by the design. Tattoos. The upper torso is covered in a single, continuous tattoo, resembling a map of the night sky. It reaches from the right shoulder to the heart. The ink is blue and white. The assistant has a color photograph of the markings, to be added to the case files as document A1. The photo is taken on the scene, using a triggered mini. The deceased has a belt for airlifting cargo around his neck, tied with a hangman's knot. Color, yellow. Length, three meters. There is a buckle on the other end. Well nourished, athletically built, measuring 1.8 meters. Generally consistent with age 42. Preservation is good. Ambient temperature below freezing. Body hair is light brown. Distribution is consistent with the age. The deceased had male pattern baldness. Hair is combed back, short. His hair feels wet, soaked with rain, cold to touch. Not that different from a living person after a swim. The stench is suffocating. Strands of dark brown hair start sticking to your hand like thread of a rag doll's head. There's brilliant time in there. He's combed his hair back with oil. Lividity is consistent with hanging. The head is congested. Contusions are present on the head, chest and thighs, consistent with stones thrown post-mortem. Low velocity. Fucking low velocity? You think Kuno doesn't know what you're talking about? Velocity was fucking max! Talking shit about Kuno's velocity. In addition, there are bite marks on the face, scalp and chest, consistent with predation. Ligature mark. A steel wiring. Ah, there's too much of it. We need to remove the bell so we can get to the ligature mark. You've got just the right tool for that. The chain cutters. The hanged man lets out a joyous little bubble of rot from his nose. Always good to think ahead. Now... We need to cut the bell to see the ligature mark below. Carefully, with as much precision as you can. See? My pig is gonna fuck his head off! No, he ain't! Your pig's a boring fuck! The belt is equally tight around the whole circumference of his neck, swelling over the edges like white bread rising from the yeast. The knot is the weak spot, 
The chain cutters fit in there, steady now, like a flower arranger. Two cuts and it should come loose. After some deliberation, you sink the cutters into the knot tying the belt together. You squeeze the rubber handles together, sweat forming on your brow. Snap! The knot is slashed. Another cut and the belt falls apart like a flower bouquet, revealing the dead man's neck and the dark red ligature mark around it. The rope rises to a point, leaving a gap in the ligature mark. The suspension point is in the back of the neck. Hemorrhaging is observed on the skin, above and below the ligature mark. The mark is well pronounced, consistent with a drop from 1 or 1.5 meters. Chest is intact, normal contour, abdomen is protuberant, pelvis intact, genitalia... No! <laughs> Let's get out and see! I fucking knew it! Genitalia is male and unremarkable. No evidence of injury. The dead man's penis is average sized, congested from the downward collection of blood. The testicles are uneven in length, hanging underneath. The genitalia is greenish. Marbling is present around the crotch. Back is symmetrical and intact. Upper and lower extremities are intact, but asymmetrical. There are combat injuries on the right hand, thigh, and hip. Bullets have bitten little pieces out of him. It must have been excruciating, especially the hip. Before you is a temple of pain, that new little tenderness in life. In addition, I see smaller, residual scars, too numerous to count, covering about 30% of his skin. From wounds sustained over two, maybe more decades, Dispersal and accumulation indicates long and active combat duty. Last item, hands. His flesh is cold, icy. Pleased to meet you. Where are you from and what's your name? I'm only fucking with you. I know where you're from. From Cappadocia. And your name is Il Corbo. What can I do you for, Il Corbo di Cappadocia? You get me, Copo. I feel like you were once for tenderness and kisses yourself, but then shit went south and now you're ahead of even me on the pain front. We should do this more often. Be close like this, I mean. Hands are clean. No sign of injury from struggling. I was. Maybe I'm just not seeing them. Honestly, the stench is making it hard for me to think at the moment. Ooh. That's all for the external. Well done. What next? Central nervous system. I have nothing. Do you have anything on this man's central nervous system? Of course, there is a moral to be drawn from it. A moral to this story. What would that be? The dead man looks, too, with barely contained excitement to hear the moral of his story. I think that may well be the moral of every story, officer. Good. Musculoskeletal. Purge fluid is coming from the mouth. Not injury related. Eyes and tongue protuberant. Hyoid bone. Let's see. With his eyes almost closed, the lieutenant puts his hand on the dead man's throat and begins to massage it, gently. A rotting smell erupts from the mouth. Purge fluid runs down his lips, black and viscous. Yeah, jack that fucker off! The hyoid bone is fractured. The rest of the musculoskeletal system is intact. Unremarkable. Respiratory system. Oral cavity shows no lesions. The victim has received a dental implant, possibly after a combat wound. Mouth swollen, hemorrhaging present in mucose of the lips and mouth. No scream, no sigh of relief rises from the darkness inside. It's humid there, sickly sweet air unlike anything living. You feel like you're about to throw up again, straight in that mouth of his. 
No, you don't. You can keep it in. You can keep anything in. You manage to suppress the contractions trying to enter your stomach. All it takes is concentration. Through it, you see nothing but darkness. More meat and darkness. There are ancient mysteries down there, Kobo. Ask me later. Hemorrhaging present in mucus. Hepatobiliary, N.A. Ah, are you a hepatobiliary expert? Neither am I. That's it. Same for toxicology and serology. And unless you have untapped reservoirs of knowledge there? Reservoirs? No, but do they take obscure trivia and odd tidbits? No. Like a toxicology screening? At this stage, I doubt processing will find anything, even if he was brimming with cocaine. But still, you should add a request. Hmm, brimming with cocaine. Cardiovascular. The body exhibits heavy lividity. Blood has gathered in the hands, feet and neck. Hypostasis is visually consistent with the hanging. Gastrointestinal. This will do. Digested semi-solid food in stomach. Voila. What's next on the list? Let's see. We have bite marks, contusions on the head and chest, and a ligature mark encircling the neck. You'll need three fills. Leave a fourth one too. Nothing. Just in case. The corpse lay slouched to the side, oblivious to its surroundings. The field autopsy form dis I thought we decided to leave it to processing. Let's not turn this into some kind of circus. Damn it. This is turning into some sort of mega puzzle. Okay, so you can sneak out of your room maybe, after he's gone asleep. All right. Bite marks, contusions on head and chest, and a ligature mark encircling the neck. Head, chest and scalp bite mark injuries. Predation by birds has caused damage to the body. Odontologist does not need to be consulted. And your opinion, officer? Agreed. Next injury? So, the scalp bleeds from a post-mortem head injury, a stone. The injury does not have the rim of an early inflammatory response. A perpetrator on the scene has confessed to causing it post-mortem. At maximum velocity, fucko! has confessed to causing it at maximum velocity. Coagulated blood sticks to his scalp and chest, where the countless stones have hit the dead man, beneath the description of injury. Two boxes. Right. Next. A dark red abraded ligature mark encircling the neck, with a gap on the nape measuring, let's say, seven centimeters. The hyoid bone is fractured, the cervical colon intact. I see hemorrhaging on the skin, above and below the ligature mark. Depth of the mark, one centimeter. No signs of clawing on the neck. Below the note, two customary boxes wait to be ticked. The man's head jerks to the side. The ring around his neck is visible. That's it. We have established cause of death. It's not much, and it leaves much to be questioned. But it's a start. Let's wrap this up. I pronounce this field autopsy over. Well, we established probable cause of death. Some would say that's the goal of an autopsy. We also requested a toxicological screening. That was thorough. The results should arrive in a couple of weeks, if we are lucky. I will not hold my breath. We were thorough with the list of injuries too. We described them all in detail. What is there to say? Given the circumstances, it was a professional field autopsy. Oh yeah, well done, Master Detective. Maybe a drink is in order? I need a copy of that autopsy form. Then I will drive him to Faubourg. For processing. You tilt your head, also looking at the corpse. Hmm. 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 I'm sure we didn't get everything. There's always something.
you run your hands over the victim's cold body, his limbs, his torso with its swollen organs, maybe you should be more thorough. His fingernails have turned dark. They're chipped and quite long. There is dirt under them. That's all. Do you think we missed something? You can't shake the feeling that there are more secrets concealed in the flesh before you. Okay, well, we are in leave of Mortis here. He is disintegrating. We need to refrigerate the body if we want to conduct another examination, and we need to do it fast. Hey, wasn't there a giant ice bear sarcophagus below that building? Now, that's an overstatement. It's not actually for storing cadavers, or at least I hope so. I think we should take a look at it first, make sure it's big enough before we carry him over. Let's move. With every hour, whatever we are looking for in the deceased will become harder to find. His eyes are still glowing red, watching over all the ice cream wrappers hidden inside its belly. It's certainly an eccentric choice, but it is capacious and cold enough, too. Your visual confirms you could fit two more bodies in the ice beer fridge. Shall we go and get the body, then? I'll take the head, you take the feet. The stairs won't be easy, but we'll manage. The body is heavier than you expected and stinkier. It takes half an hour to get it down to the basement, then 10 more minutes to stuff it into the fridge. The lieutenant takes a step back to admire your handiwork. Beautiful, a dead body in a nice bare fridge. This is some of the best police work I've ever done. Of course you don't. Look at that. What have we done? We stuffed a dead body in a nice bare fridge. This does not leave this room. Did we, though? Okay, maybe we did. At least we've stopped the body from decomposing further. Now you can conduct another inspection under controlled circumstances. Inside the icy realm of the ice bear fridge, the corpse stands slumped, waiting. Shoot, Looney Rooney. I like it a lot, brother. This really is your finest hour. You're a genius. A regular Cobalangelo. Oh yes, Cobo Mi Lobo. In the gift horse's mouth. Track and wakes and waterways, ancient materials buried. Just a small gulp away, my beloved Kobo, a small gulp away. Come back later, Kobo. Amuse yourself with my frank manners and my memento mori features. If possible, also, see me in your dreams. You touch the dead man's body. His skin is cold, light blue and silvery in the light of the fridge. You still have no idea where to begin, or what to even do with him. It'll come to you sooner or later. At least he's safe here until then.
can I help you? Got the 20 real. Good. You got the room for the night, but remember, you'll need another 20 real tomorrow. You're already set for the night. Your door is unlocked. I've got nothing to say to you. Why are you wasting your time? I am not. You could be Liz. You could be anything. You could even be a model. Even a mod? Glenn, I went to law school. I am an attorney. He's right. With a face like that, she could be on the cover of Le Debutante International. The cold look in her eyes speaks louder than words. She is not amused. It's not her. She's not a hardy girl. Definitely. I suggest not wasting time on trivial pleasantries and focusing on why you are actually here. Titus Hardy. Even though she has excellent control over herself, something moved behind her eyes, in the way she stands, in her face. You are not here to chat up the legal counsel. You are here to question these men. Looks like the circus left town, but the clowns are still here. Again, just get the dead guy's autograph, since you're his biggest fan. <laughs> Good one, Titus. About fucking time. with loose nails and rock-infested wood that creaks in the wind. A construction code violation if there ever was one. True. They never cleaned up the wall damage. The rest of Revachol looks better, though. The bridge is fine enough. Locals use it all the time, after all. It's nothing to worry about. Shall we? This must be it. The basement door is weather-worn. The copper nails holding the upholstery in place have turned green from sea air, and there's a knocker shaped like a lion's head. The leather upholstery is worn and rough against your jaw. You don't hear any movement. In fact, it's oddly silent in the yard around you. No birds chirp. You knock silently. The upholstery muffles the sound. No response comes from the apartment. I guess no one is in? Let's be honest, this isn't what I joined the RCM for, but every day tells you something new about yourself. Apparently, working with the local union boss to get info on an investigation is not something I'm squeamish about. I mind that a local thug is using the RCM for his busy work. But if this gets us to the bottom of this hanging, then I'm willing to look over it. On the other hand, we could just leave and tell Evrat we opened the door. No one seems to be tailing us to see if we actually did it. Yes, presenting a fabrication is known to get results here and there. You took this task. You make the call. The door is right here. You can just open it and be done with this. Besides, if you never open it, you're never gonna find out what's behind the door. You try to be as silent as you can. It takes a bit of rattling of the handle to loosen the bolt. Finally, the door unlocks with a small clack. Thoughts race through your head. Only curiosity could account for stepping over that threshold. Maybe there's treasure in there. A white alligator, 
a fountain of quicksilver. As you hold the open door, you can feel the air moving. A little draft, a whistle. Master Investigator, you just can't keep yourself away from locked and hidden places, can you? Nothing, nothing. You're right. Get in there. Deep. Invade every personal space. Break every lock. Attaboy, the world's secrets were made for you. They wait patiently for you to uncover them. This is the flag of Rivershaw, the Suzerainty. This isn't just one sun, but there are little suns dancing around the big sun. This is the sevenfold sun miracle. It's an optical atmospheric anomaly the first settlers saw. Happens in cold weather. Six small suns around the big one. This complex halo phenomena is how old Rivershaw got its flag. Mm-hmm. The tenant is an old-fashioned guy. By old-fashioned, he means very right-wing. The flag doesn't seem to mind. It's just a colorful fabric with a sun sewn onto it. Like all feudal flags, it looks like a children's drawing. mugs sits on the shelf. Each one depicts a human figure. A dark-skinned woman grinning amidst mysterious symbols. A broad-shouldered man shoveling potatoes and others. A little ring. Though cheerful, the images on the ceramic make you vaguely uncomfortable. There's something disdainful in the way the curves and lines of the bodies were drawn. It looks like the artist is celebrating diversity, but underneath He's just making fun of these people. No one's telling you to like him. You might learn something from him, though. The lieutenant picks up one of the mugs, then puts it back down with a look of disdain. I'm beginning to feel better about breaking into this man's apartment. Yes, your broken mug friend would feel very much at home here. The same humor, the same mocking lines. There's the missing tin soldier. Whoever lives here might have used the Whirling's container to dump his trash. And now they've drawn the ire of the Union. The plot thickens, as they say. An interesting little clue. Let's see where this goes. Clues have a way of magically connecting to other clues down the road. Perhaps you should break into apartments more often. Who knows? I'm not expecting too much from this close-in-the-trash lead either way. It might turn out to be some random local matter, but still, a nice coincidence. You could ask Everard who this person is once you're done here.
This door is made of metal and appears to be reinforced. Someone here really values their security. No one answers. We should return tomorrow. Tomorrow at 9 p.m. Inside, you see a set of steering levers, a radio microphone, a pull-out toolbox, and the soft glow of the fuel preheater gauge. This is Precinct 57. How may I assist you? Yes. The armor was produced by Fairweather in their facilities in Betancourt, sur la clé in 42. It was part of a special order for Corps de Pharmacie, a security firm contracted to protect the interests of Iranian pharmaceutical companies in the Seminine conflict. So, it seems the armor went to Seminine. That's where the paper trail ends, though. Even the firm has proven difficult to track. Corps de Pharmacie has been renamed several times over in the years since the armor was issued. The most recently registered firm that the ICP has been able to connect to the CDP is a military contractor called Trinel, and the one before it was down well. I think they might be the same contractor. A suit of armor like this would have been manufactured with a particular person's physique in mind. You should ask for whom this suit was fitted. Hard to say. The client list is rather diverse and incomplete. The only constant seems to be that the mercenaries are always deployed in third and fourth world countries. Yes, but the ICP tends to be reluctant to their private sector records. I could try to talk them into it though. Sure. Call back tomorrow. Hopefully I will have more information for you then. Just a second, officer. Sylvie Malaika on the line for you, officer. Yes. Hello? Oh, great. What else do you need, detective? Yes, I know who you are. You're a police officer. The law. This exact conversation has happened before. Establishing authority before this young girl seems to have been important to you in the past. Don't go there again. You, you told me back in the whirling. You told everybody, and so does your badge. I don't need to hear about it anymore. Oh, no, 
I haven't, sorry. Real policemen have uniforms too, by the way. Where's yours? He's in plain clothes, voluntarily. It's different from not knowing where your uniform is. Uniform? I, I never saw you in any uniform. You had your things on, the disco things. You hear the call breaking up on the other end of the radio, and then the already familiar voice. Anything else I can help you with, officer? 57th, over and out. In the cabin, you see a set of steering levers, a radio on a hook, a pull-out toolbox, and the soft glow of the fuel preheater gauge. not lessened since you were last here. If anything, it seems to have grown slightly. Mr. Dubois, a pleasure as always. You don't have to sit down this time, since you've already sat on that chair. My dear Harry, there are literally millions of containers in this harbour. I couldn't possibly remember what's in all of them. Harry, you smooth-talking son of a bitch. Time is a precious resource, and I don't have enough of it to count containers with you. Smooth-talking? Maybe that's the way to go about opening the container. You should at least try convincing it. I'm very glad to hear that, Harry. One question. You didn't actually happen to stumble in and see what's inside the apartment, did you? Just as I thought. Culturally antiquated mug collection. What a weasel. Pissing on Everart's Rainbow Coalition. Now let's get down to brass tacks. It's time for men like me and you to figure out who's killed who and why. Real police work is going to start happening now. I promise you, Harry, this is going to be good. Racist mugs in the trash and in the apartment? You guys are just light years ahead of me. I have so much confidence in the ability of your organisation, I'm relieved you're doing this and leaving me to do what I do best, helping people with the power of politics. Yes, yes. Do you think this weasel is somehow connected to the murder? Oh, no, 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 no. I don't cross paths like that. All I want is for you to succeed in your investigation. 
I would never complicate things for you. Believe me, Harry, he's a nobody. Just your basement variety nobody. Can't imagine him being connected to a high-caliber case like this. But he does live nearby. Maybe it's a pedantic weasel. Fascists are known to be neat freaks. I feel like a real detective right now, Harry. Am I getting this right? Would he? I'm not so sure about it. Oh, you're too kind, Harry. Way too kind. <laughs> I know I'm not a real police officer. You are. By now, I'm sure you've figured out who the dead man was working for. The bad guys. Wild pines. Sent to scare us. Another violent measure of the top hats against us flat caps. Harry, this strike is the culmination of many, many mistakes made by the Wild Pines group. They tried to shut the strike down by sending in armed mercenaries. You mean our victim? A security contractor? Can you imagine that? Workers standing in peaceful protest, united in the spirit of fellowship, and they send hired killers to mow us down with machine gun fire? He performs a motion as if spraying bullets from a machine gun. I'm talking beasts, hardened killers from proxy wars in Yisut, Seminine, Santa Maritza. You name it, they've done it. Raping, killing, burning villages, killing little children for the Senorita Pineapple Company, Harry. Everything they did there, they brought over here. They want to turn Revachol into a third world slum. Honestly, the only thing they didn't do is kill the village elephant. No, Harry, the elephant is metaphorical and so is the village, but the mercs and their brutality are very real. Now, I haven't personally witnessed the brutalities out there. I have the luxury of staying in my container, you see. If I need to go somewhere, they just move my container. Yes, I'm an old man, Harry. My legs aren't what they used to be. They lift my office with that big crane. It's actually very fun. You should try it. But enough about me and my fun container. The killers the company hired, I think there were three of them, all hardened commando types. One of them got downright suicidal, getting drunk, violent, a little rapey. Even their own negotiator couldn't control him. That's your boy, the one who likes hanging out and trees. By negotiator, you mean Joyce? Harry, what you need to realize is, we dock workers are not pushovers. We got grit, Harry. This whole neighborhood does. Push us hard enough and we push back. And when we do, we push to kill. Potentially, Harry, potentially. We got arm wrestling champions, rowing club people, ex-coal miners, tough guys, all ready to spring into action for their home base. There's a militant wing inside the Union, a group of people whose duties don't involve manual labor, but peacekeeping in the neighborhood, making sure everything runs smoothly. That sounds a bit like organized crime. They're like you guys. Idealistic people who want to make sure bad things don't happen. And if they already have, well, punishment must follow. Again, that sounds like organized crime. So these idealists killed our victim? Hmm. One day Titus Hardy, leader of this peacekeeping faction, comes up to me and says, Boss, socialist democratic fervor drove us to take it upon ourselves to kill this beast that was burdening the land. He probably worded it differently, but that was the idea. Sure sounded to me like they killed him. I gave them two weeks paid leave and told them to lay low to avoid retaliation. Aren't you worried we might arrest them for this? Oh, I'm not at all worried about that. These are not the kind of men who get arrested. They're Martin A's boys, tough and gritty. I'd like to see the man who takes them in. Besides, I sent my lawyer girl to look after them. He places a lot of faith in that lawyer girl. Perhaps this is a tactical error? Anyway. How do I know? Let me tell you about these people. That's their M.O. It's what they do. Last winter, some poor workers in Terminal E went on a little strike. The company sent in Sediment, a security contractor. The strike was over the workers' right to wear protective footwear, Harry. These guys turn up and start beating people. 
Tell you what, Harry, I wouldn't be surprised if we got the same mercenary company after a little rebranding. And I'm sure as hell not surprised to see an army of scabs under my gates. So you believe the scabs were organized by the security contractor? You said it. Hell, one of those guys looks big enough to take down that proverbial elephant. Boys like that don't just happen to show up during strikes. Of course, you're always one step ahead of me, Harry. I'm no genius. I'm in this position because people like me. Oh, Liz is a bright one. I paid for that law degree myself, thinking it'll probably turn her all fancy. But hell, Harry, she came back a firebrand socialist. Sometimes she scares me with her zeal. Oh, they are simply fine young men, all seven of them. Exemplary union members, always working to advance their position in the local socialist democratic movement. Core members. Old Theo used to run them, but things really kicked into gear when Titus took the reins and named the group after himself. <laughs> Gotta love his initiative. Interesting. Who's second in command? They're almost all of them great guys, born leaders. Whatever happened, I'm sure they only had the best interests of Martin A's and Revachol in mind. Work with them. Hell, interview them. But don't fight them. They really are just like you. Men who like beer, women, and some order on the streets. But of course, it's the least I can do for my good friend Harry. I'll do it right after we've concluded this talk. You can now go and tell Titus about this. See what he has to say. Also, Harry, here's five real. I'm not giving you anything. I'm just holding out five real. The lieutenant watches you pocket the banknote. He looks a little puzzled. Good boy. A real team player. Now, do you have any more questions? Was it a good tour? I'm not sure we made much headway here. I was hoping we'd bust the case wide open. Heck, I even wanted to tell you what I really want to achieve with the strike. I don't know what happened, Harry. I wanted you to feel like Mr. Martin A's. And, of course, I also wanted you to find your gun. But... It's like I can't completely trust you. Yet. Yes, Harry. It's like I can't fully trust you if you're not a man of the left. I want to, but I just can't. A man of the left. So you have to be a social democrat. He's been hurt too much in the past by men who aren't social democrats. You're saying it, but I don't believe you. You know how it is, company snitches, agent provocateurs everywhere. I'm barricaded in this fortress of mine, and I need to get a message out. Will you help me? And what would this entail? Once again, I require nothing unethical or illegal of you. You just need to get two little signatures on this piece of paper, and then mail it to my accountant in La Delta. It depends. I don't think what we just got from Mr. Clare was very useful. But, he thinks, it's your call. As I said, it weighs on me heavily. But once we get really talking, well, I'm going to hand you the keys to Martin A's, and maybe even help you figure out who's behind this killing. He's saying as little as possible, as vaguely as he can, deliberately omitting things. I'm glad you asked, Harry. The Union is going to build a modern youth centre in Martin Ames. It will be righteous. We're gonna get those teenagers off drugs and on roller skates. There's a nameless little street on the coast with some old houses around it. Most people have already signed. I just need two more signatures to get this mission off the ground, Harry. On the coast, Harry, across the canal. There's a cul-de-sac there, a little village they're calling it. A gloomy place. You'll find it. I trust your detective skills, Harry. Water drips from the eaves. A woman looks at her freshly tarred skiff. There's a pair of cavalry boots under the fish in the box, and the wind howls like a vicious spirit. They are just going to have to deal with the construction noise for six months, and then they'll be living like kings. Right next to a fancy new youth centre designed by the best architects from Stella Marie. 
Is he absolutely sure the tenants won't be thrown out in the street? Am I? Harry, these people... Martinez is the most important thing in my life. I would never let anything bad happen to them. We're gonna build a youth center there. The value of their properties goes up and kids have a place to play in. I'm looking out for these people, not pulling the rug from under them, Harry. I'm looking out for all of Martinez, not just the harbor. You bring joy to my heart, Harry. Such a pleasure to be working with you. Here. You need to get signatures from Isabel Sadie and Lillian Carter. The cul-de-sac is right past the pawn shop and across the canal. I hear there is some trouble with the waterlock, but they should fix it by Wednesday morning. Once you have the signatures, mail this to 13022 La Roca in La Delta. Then I'll know you're a solid socialist. Most certainly, Harry. Nothing brightens my day like brainstorming these things with you. By all means, Harry. What's on your mind? See you soon, Debardeur. Just kidding, but not too much. You take the legal documents out of the envelope. A 12 to 40 month construction period and the zoning plan in the addendum. The youth center cuts into the ocean like the bow of some great modern ship. Apparently, it's going to cover most, if not all, of the street and the square between the existing houses. It's three stories tall. It's going to be awfully close to the already existing buildings, almost wall to wall, practically integrating them into the youth center. This is either an ominous or cool architectural choice. Hard to say. My money is on cool. Looks like a cubic pyrite. I'm no property lawyer, but it looks fine. I like the print size. They're not selling or leasing anything. It's not a perfect solution, but... How else are you going to build something? It's always inconvenient to build things and citizens inevitably have disagreements over such construction projects. But there's no other way. There is no loophole. The simple truth is, the current residents are going to lose their street access, and for the next 12 to 40 months, their lives will be dominated by constant construction noise right next door. Once the construction starts, it'll probably take a few months, a year maybe, for even the most stubborn occupants to get tired of living like this. After that, they'll sell their property for cheap and move out. I should have seen it. Evra probably has eyes on us, but we could try to get other people to sign this instead of those listed. Or you could forge their signatures yourself. By the time he finds out, we'll already be gone. However, We'll need access to the coast before we do anything. Evart won't believe you got villager signatures if you can't even get to the village. You can try forgery as soon as we can cross the water lock. Special thanks to my patrons, Justin Wood, Hobbs, Koopy, Vegeta, Gunrunner, Water, and Bat. You can join my patrons at patreon.com slash holdengatsby, follow me on Twitter at holdengatsby, and follow my Twitch at twitch.tv slash holdengatsby. Don't forget to subscribe to both of my channels. Thanks for watching. Bye.